Champions Mojo is part of the CG Sports Network. Welcome to the award-winning Champions Mojo, hosted by two world record-holding athletes and health, life, and leadership coaches. Be inspired as you listen to Conversations with Champions. And now, your hosts, Kelly Palace and Maria Parker. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Champions Mojo podcast. And with me today, as usual, is my co-host, Maria Parker. Hey, Maria. Hi, Kelly. So excited to be here today. Yes, yes. Uh, we we will be giving a, a longer introduction to our special guest today, but we want to say hi quickly before we introduce her. Olympian Natalie Hines, welcome to Champions Mojo. Welcome. Hi, guys. Thank you so much for having me. Yes. So, Maria, what a pleasure it is to have the newly minted Natalie Hines <laughs> on the show, newly Olympic minted. And if you like comeback stories, please, everyone stick around because this is going to be so inspiring. In 2016, Natalie thought she had retired from swimming after finishing 40th in the 2016 Olympic trials. But this year, her comeback story is complete after she just finished fourth at last week's U.S. Olympic trials, earning a spot on the 2021 U.S. Olympic team. After almost four years away from the pool, which included working a job at Turner Broadcasting in Atlanta, Natalie found herself wanting to compete again. So she joined in 2018, she joined the University of Georgia pro group under Jack Bowerly. It's an amazing story. We can't wait to hear more, but Maria, what else can you tell us about Natalie? Uh, I'd love to tell you more about Natalie. She hails originally from Midland, Texas, and they're quite proud of her and swam collegiately at the University of Florida, where they're also quite proud of her. There at University of Florida, she earned NCAA All-American honors over 15 times and broke school records as a sprinter. Besides being an Olympian, Natalie also swam professionally in 2019 and 2020 for the ISL champions, Cali Condors, and she's represented by the CG Sports Network. Natalie's got a unique perspective on diversity in swimming, the ups and downs of comebacks and of her comeback and what she learned from her time away from the pool. But we want to hear all about that from Natalie herself. Welcome to Champions Mojo, Natalie. Thank you. I appreciate it. So we, we've got to dive right in with the comeback story. So give us, uh, give us the comeback story. Okay. I'll give you the cliff notes because we could be here all day, yes. but I want to um, hear it. Yeah. So like you said, in 2016, I went to trials and did really for my expectations, I did not meet them at all. And I was really, really discouraged. And I don't know if I like retired then and there, but I definitely wanted nothing to do with swimming. Um, so I went home back to Texas for three months and kind of just, you know, was at home and kind of just trying to reground myself. And I didn't know if I wanted to keep swimming, but I didn't put a time stamp on it of when I would go back to the sport. So I got an internship there with an advertising company and um, everything was just really new for me because I've never really had a job like that before. <laughs> I went back to Florida and graduated that December. Um, and then I worked a little bit in Gainesville and um, got this really, really, really amazing opportunity in Atlanta with Turner Broadcasting for a year long internship where I learned how to build apps on your phone. Wow. And so um, I don't even know how I got that. I just feel like I was, I knew the right people at the right time and um, really, really studied to get this job. I was like, I really think this is a good, good, uh, beginning for me. So I moved to Atlanta. Um, and I, it's the first time I lived by myself and I had a new job and everything was so new and it was such a transition for me. And, um, swimming wasn't even in my, my mind frame at all. I just was trying to, I was just thinking like, I need to get a job from this internship. And, um, Cause you know, like you have an internship and you're living in the city. I was like, I was so broke. <laughs> I was just trying to um, make ends meet as well as learn all everything that I could. I also was a swim coach as for my second job. So I was just burning the candle at both ends. Um, finally, like having a social life and, and meeting people and stuff. But I feel like I just never really um, had closure with swimming. I just literally walked out of the arena and didn't want to think about it. I didn't want to talk about it with my parents or friends. I never really wanted to check up on stats. Um, 
And so I knew that that was probably a me issue. Like I needed to sort that out at some point. Um, and so the summer of 2018, I saw nationals and I think it was in Irvine or something like that. And I remember specifically seeing um, some people that I knew from college and I was like, wow, they just look like they're genuinely having so much fun. And it wasn't like I was not having fun. I just always felt deep down that if I wasn't going to try swimming again, that I would just like be kind of bitter about it. And I would regret it for a very, very long time. Um, and so finally I, you know, it took a long time to kind of just look within myself and, and see kind of where I went wrong and how, you know, why did things happen the way they did leading up to trials and then at trials, which led me to walk away. Um, and so finally, once I sorted that out, I was able to talk with my parents and decide that I think I'm going to try and swim again, which is a really scary thought. I mean, I wasn't in shape at all. I was, I go to, went to the gym a lot, but that's not the same as being in swimming shape. And, um, I was thinking like, where am I going to train? And Jack, who'd always been so gracious towards me when, uh, while I was at Florida in college was like, you know, anything you ever need, let me know. And I like, took him up on that offer. So I called him and I called um, the sprint coach who I also work with Brian Smith. And I was like, and I, all I said was, Hey, I think I want to swim again. Do you think that that would be possible at UGA? Like, do you think I could come? Um, so I had a, two long conversations with Jack and it wasn't, I was thinking that they were going to jump on the opportunity. They actually didn't. I think just because of compliance and stuff it is a lot to just bring someone in who didn't actually go to the school so my first call with him it was just more of more of let me see what I can do and so then I was like oh my god I maybe this can happen like maybe I can't you know maybe I'm gonna have to move somewhere else or something like that but finally we were able to work everything out and I believe it was a Wednesday he called me and said okay everything's good you can come up whenever you're ready and I, my bags in the U-Haul were packed, ready to go to Athens on that Saturday. So I was like very ready to go. Um, and so, yeah, I showed up um, and just got, I showed up on Saturday and I started swimming with the team on Monday and I was very out of shape. And I think what struck me the most was all of the little things that you forget um, that, that you take for granted, I guess, just being able to like walk on deck and like talk to people, people don't think that that's a big deal, but it is like to just have that social aspect of swimming. And so it was kind of like, I was starting new again. I just felt re fell in love with the sport and I was like, wow, this is so cool. This is so cool. And, um, and that's kind of what started from there. And I just have, I'm really proud that I've been able to keep that same, um, theme throughout, like all the way up until today of just being very grateful for everything, even the good things and the bad things as well. So that's kind of where I'm at today with my comeback. Um, I obviously still train at UGA and, um, you know, I learned a lot about myself this past week, but also really a lot um, in the past two months leading up to trials, which I think helped me be successful at trials. What did you learn? Well, let me pull out the list, but to keep it short, um, I learned that being in the moment is very important. And at a meet like Olympic trials, it's really intense um, to say the least. Uh, you, you know, to make the team in the events that I swim, you have to put together three really good swims. And of course, finals is most important because you wanna make the team. But I mean, you can't make the team if you don't make semifinals. Um, so your prelim swim has to be really good as well. And also your semifinal. So I learned to just be in the moment and I learned to really trust myself. And I feel like all throughout my career, I've been told to trust myself and I thought that I was, but I think I actually learned what that meant and, um, you know, and how that actually impacts my swimming for me personally. And I also learned about the power of a routine. And for me personally, I think a routine is, is so important, especially in a high pressure situation because the work has been done and all you can really do is go through your routine to calm your nerves and calm your mind. So those are definitely some of the big takeaways that I had from starting at the beginning of the year um, 
we had two meets in San Antonio where I did terrible. And I, I think looking at my routine and, and kind of how I'm approaching, how I was approaching the swim meet and how I was approaching um, my performances needed to be reviewed. And so once I was able to sit down and, and try and change things is when I started to see big improvements. Can you, can you get, I love the phrase, trust myself. Mm -hmm. But like you said, you know, you thought you trusted yourself. Can you give an example of what that meant to you as you matured in your swimming? Yeah. So, um, I've always thought that I, I was faster than I was swimming. If that makes sense. Like every time that I would go best time, I'd always be like, but I think I probably could go faster. I just wasn't always happy with the result. And, um, starting in, I want to say March, we went to a meet in mission Viejo. And I just started, I changed everything, like my pre-meet warm up. Uh, I changed everything prior to what I had been doing before. Like even the whole past two and a half years, I changed um, like what I was eating and when I was eating it. And I changed uh, my pre-meet stretch routine. I even changed the songs I was listening to because I just came to the conclusion that I don't know if I'm going to be at another Olympic trial. So this one really needs to count. And I'm going to do everything that I can to make this team. And so, yeah, I changed basically everything. I changed how I talked to myself. Um, I worked with Christian Chef Chunas. She is known as the confidence coach. And I just changed what was coming out of my mouth and what I also was telling myself, even in practice, even at home, at at any sort. It was really hard, obviously, but um, I was like, I have to do this because if I don't, then I, I like will not leave a regret on the table, you know? Um, so yeah, I just changed all that and went to mission and out of my six swims, I had three really good ones. So I was like, okay, this is kind of working. So I'm going to keep on with this. Um, we then had a tune up meet in Atlanta. It was the meet before trials and it was nice that it was local. So that kind of took some of the stress away. Like I don't have to travel across the country. Um, but I kept things consistent as consistent as, as I could, you know, with being in a hotel and at a swim meet, but Um, and went two best times there. And so I was like, okay, this is definitely working. Like I'm on my way to swimming really good. If I keep the same routine, the same mental perspective and just create a tunnel vision for myself and, um, boundaries are, I learned that boundaries are very important. Um, so I just wanted to make sure to tighten up, um, my mental approach and keeping all my physical stuff the same. And I think that did, did wonders for me while I was in those high pressure situations, because I was able to be okay with the fact that there's nothing left for me to do. Like I already have done it and I know how to do it. So, um, really all I needed to do at trials was just make sure that my boundaries were up and, uh, and the fact that I was okay being selfish. I think a lot of people don't want to be selfish, but there is a time and a place where it is okay Um, and that is at Olympic trials. So I think that's kind of what helped me have a great meet. Can you describe what you were saying to yourself behind the blocks and also what boundaries mean? Um, so like behind the blocks for the final or before all of that, like maybe, maybe for reach of it, (laughs) you know, because yeah, you, you, you guys, you were seated, you know, top two going into semis. So you, you know. Yeah, like for all of it. Mm-hmm. So for I guess I for like comparison, um, before I had changed what I was thinking and stuff, it wasn't that I was thinking bad things. It kind of was like I was rehearsing the race in my head, like okay, fast start. Um, the like, you know just trying to rehearse like things I want to do in the race. But the problem was that I already knew how to do them, and so it was just me crowding my own head with what I need to do, and I'm like okay, well, I already know how to do that. And I think I was worried about what other people were doing. And that's a lot easier said than done. I think that's something that you have to practice is just like really putting on your blinders. And, and I mean, I physically had to look away. That's how I had to learn to teach myself to, to just focus on myself. I had to, if I saw someone and started thinking about what they were doing, I had to physically look the other way um, just to get my mind off of it. And so that was really hard, but yeah, I mean, there was nothing going on in my mind before the 100 free final, I think. Um, 
all day. I think the worst part of that was sitting there all day waiting for a final and, you know, being so close to your dream goal that you've had for so long and you're sitting in a hotel room, just like stewing, like waiting. It's, it's not the best feeling, but the only thing I could do is just take a deep breath. And I had started deep breathing uh, in mission in March. And I found that me being behind the blocks, like with my shoulders as relaxed as I can with the deepest breath that I can, is it going to allow me to swim the fastest, swim my fastest? So that's really all I focused on was anytime I had a thought in my mind, I would just take a deep breath and let it go. Um, and yeah, so sitting, so being behind the blocks, there was nothing going on. I don't even, I don't really remember anything, which is probably a good thing. Cause that means I was very focused, but it all started with with deep breaths. Um, I know I visualized my race once or twice before I walk to the ready room. But other than that, I try not to look at anyone just like I said before, because I um, want to keep my own like blinders on tunnel vision. But yeah, I just, I just took a deep breath once the whistle was blown and stepped on the block. I was like, there's really nothing I can tell myself at this point. Like it's already been, the writing is already on the wall. So. And the boundaries were oh, not looking, down. not looking at other people and their, you know, what they were doing, or is that the bound or those the boundaries? Um, that is part of it. It also, um, boundaries mean anything from, you know, on the lead up, like the three weeks before the meet, who are you talking to? Who are you? Are you on social media? What are you looking at? That's, you know, feeding your subconscious. And I came to the conclusion, like, I don't want to be on social media. I don't want to see previews of stuff. I don't want to see people getting ready and posting their workouts or this or that. And it's no, no um, offense to them. It's just not what I needed to get ready. I wanted to have, you know, I didn't want to have anything in the back of my mind. So I got off social media like three weeks before trials. Um, and I already pre-planned when I was going to stop. Um, my, I have a fiber business when I was going to stop and just when I was going to send my last package, just so I wasn't running around trying to tie up loose ends. And, you know, even with my friends and family, like I had to put up boundaries, but like, obviously they understand because I'm going to this huge swim meet. Um, but that's basically what I mean by boundaries is like, what am I willing to like put my energy into? And it was really all about me at that point in time. So my family and friends definitely understood and, and definitely supported me through all that. And I'm really grateful for that. So, um, yeah, that's what I mean by boundaries is just like literally not letting anything in except for the people at the pool. And I obviously talked to my parents throughout the whole thing, but other than that, I didn't really talk to anyone for like a month, a month and a half. So you, you, you talked about self-talk basically. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so, you know, you've, you've done a great job of describing like what didn't come in. So mm -hmm. during this three weeks where you're not on social media and you're not worrying about what other people are doing, and you know, you're obviously taking care of yourself and working out and, and eating right and so forth. But what do you, what are you allowing in? What's your mantras? What's your, what, what was, what did you think? So, you know, there, I know you guys have heard of a lot about the what ifs and like a lot, everyone yeah. has what ifs, you know, it's like, what if I've done all this work and I don't make the team and am, am I a failure? And so I think what helped for me is I came up with a plan A and a plan B just because I like to have plan. I like to know what's coming down the pipeline, but my plan A is that I make the team and all is well and everything, you know, everything's peachy. And then plan B was like, well, what if I don't make the team? Because, you know, it's 52 people out of 1500 people. I mean, that's a very small fraction. I don't know math that well, but um, <laughs> it's, small. it's a really small group of people. And the chances of you making it are greater than the chances, the chances of you not making it are greater than if you do. So my plan B was, was drilled into my head that that doesn't mean that my swim career was a failure. Like I was okay if I didn't make the team, but obviously I really wanted to make it. Um, so yeah, I just, I, I tried to if I had a bad thought come in, I immediately thought of, well, what if like the positive side of that, you know, it's like, well, what, what if I miss a wall? Well, what if I have a really good wall? And of course it sounds like, so I guess, um, elementary, it's, it's just like so simple to think, but after a while it, 
it just was automatic for me. And it really helped me like on the day of the 100 free final because, you know, you're sitting there in a hotel room for like eight hours and you're like, oh, what if I don't make it? Well, what if I have the swim of my life? Like, you know, you never really know. So um, that's kind of how I dealt with the self-talk. And I meditate but once, once a day, or if I need more, I meditate more. But I think um, that once a day from meditation is very grounding for me. Um, and I've been meditating for a long time and I'm not a patient person by any means. So seeing that payoff took so long, but I'm so glad that I stuck with it because I started meditating y'all like last November. I mean, it's been so long for me to see and be able to try and control my mind. I mean, sometimes I can't, but, um, that really helped me as well. So the self-talk obviously is not an overnight thing. Obviously it's, it's it's really hard. And, and anyone who has really tough, has a tough mental side, like I commend them because I, you know, I'm still learning and this is my first meet where it actually kind of worked out for me. So it makes me excited for the future. It makes me excited for the Olympics because, you know, I feel like if anybody can get through trials, you can literally do anything that you set your mind to, because it is just such a tough meet. Can you share your meditation practice with us? Oh, I just listen to calm, whatever the daily calm is. I feel like they're going to give me what I need. So some days are about planting a seed. Some days are about riding the waves. Some days are about just focusing on noise, you know, instead of focusing on the silence, sometimes they challenge you in different ways. Um, but I know a lot of people, some of my teammates use the headspace app. Um, and also it's important for me to talk to someone and I've tried journaling. I've tried, um, like, I guess just reviewing my, my, my day. Um, but I think talking to someone, especially, you know, leading up to trials is really, really big for me just to get it, just to get it off my chest. Um, so I think though that was really important. So that's basically my meditation. It's nothing crazy. I, I like that. Talk to someone simple. because I, you don't hear, I mean, in what you've described, it sounds sort of isolated. So, Very, but, uh, yeah. but, but so who's, is there, can, is there a person, a go-to person that you talk to, you know, that you say, I, you know, I need to um, dump this or. No, I mean, my parents are there. I, I talk to my parents every day. We're very close. So I talk to either, either one of them. I talk to them once a day. Um, Kristen, who I mentioned earlier is um, known as the confidence coach. I would just, you know, dump my deepest fears on her and she would be like, it, it, you know, it's okay to have those fears. She taught me this. This is really, um, a, was a big learn, a big experience that I learned was that it like is okay to have fears. And I think before my, before I took a break from the sport, like I used to think that no one else had those fears that were running through my head and that I was, that I needed to ignore them and you can't ignore an elephant in the room. So <laughs> once true. I learned that these are totally fine, um, I would, that really helped my confidence. Like, oh yeah. Okay. Everybody feels like this. So like, it's totally fine. Like you can have the fears, but you just need to know what to do with them. So um, I talk to her a lot. <laughs> so so yeah. Natalie, uh, this is so fascinating. We could, we want to respect <laughs> your time. Um, yeah. and without question, you know, you are breaking barriers by being, you know, a, a an Olympic swimmer who is also black. <laughs> mm -hmm. So can you share with us, um, you know, your thoughts on diversity in swimming or just in general, or just, you know, open forum for yeah. what you, what you've been doing and your thoughts. Yeah. So just the fact that I've made the Olympic team and I'm the fourth black woman, to, woman to do so is hasn't really sunk in yet. Um, I don't know if it will sink in. I think it's so cool, but it's also kind of sad at the same time. Mm. Um, to be part of such a rare group, but um, I feel like I've been able to use my platform more lately for diversity in swimming. Because as you know, swimming is a predominantly white sport. And the reason that is, is because it's so expensive. I mean, to go to a swim meet, you have hotel, you have food, you have travel. Um, there's probably not, it's not just you going. So you have other people you have to pay for, you know, stuff like that. So 
as I've gotten older, I've learned to appreciate just how much my parents were able to support me and just how much my club team was able to support me because I'm from a very small town. So once I went outside of the town, it was like everyone was behind me. People were sending in donations like for tech suits because tech suits are so expensive. Um, and I was fortunate enough to live two minutes from my home, my club pool. Whereas, I don't know, people in Washington, D.C. or people in another inner city network, they have to drive like 40 to 45 minutes to get to practice from school or from their home. And so in a, in a bigger city like that, it's just not really feasible for lower socioeconomic um, Black families to get their kids to a sport where they then have to pay for a suit cap goggles um, and that's why sports like basketball and football are more popular because it doesn't cost money to just pick up a basketball on a court and play a pickup game and you know enhance your game that way so the sport all is very expensive there's also not a lot of support um, I know last year I needed a lot of help uh, with my mental health just to deal with everything that's going on and then to continue to go to practice and not see anybody who looks like me and um, have any support in that manner. So um, it's definitely been a learning experience for everyone, myself included, on what we actually need to do to get more Black people or people of minority uh, into the sport of swimming. And so I want to say this time last year, there was a group form called Team Black, and it was headed by Marissa McClendon. And so it's comprised of older Olympians who are of a minority and then active swimmers such as myself, Simone, Manuel, Leah Neal, Reese Whitley, um, and there's a few more, but this group kind of formed out of nothing just basically after the murder of George Floyd. And it was like, okay, this, that's kind of like the last straw, like what can we do in our arena to help people of color? And so the group took about six months to kind of figure out what we, what the point of the group was and like what our focus was. But as of right now, I had to distance myself from the group only because of trials, like boundaries. Um, but when I last had left them, you know, I had sat, we had sat in on meetings for a few months uh, with USA Swimming, because again, there's an elephant in the room and USA Swimming and Team Black are, you know, like dancing around this elephant in the room, like, okay, who's going to make the first move? What do we talk about? And how do we talk about it? So there was a lot of conversations on just like, where is their budget? Where, you know, where are their funds being allocated? And, you know, how can our group help? Like, do you guys need help with the social media posts to, you know, to reach out to those uh, people of color? Like, how do you let a mother know that her child will be okay in the sport of swimming if you decide to become a USA Swimming member? So those are the conversations that were being had. And I believe they are still being had. This is an ongoing thing. Um, but yeah, I'll be back after the summer, hopefully to give my opinion and listen in. But um, things are definitely looking up because as of, I think last year, the, the, the population of members who were black was like 1.5, which is crazy. Cause I think there's like 250,000 members or something in USA swimming. So um, things are definitely going in a positive direction. I think just having the conversations is a really big step because nobody wants to have them. So um, trying to just get, get grants and see how else can we support, you know, a kid who wants to swim, but doesn't really have a pool to do that at, or someone who doesn't know how to swim. Like once they learn how to swim, can we put them on a competitive swim team so they can become a better swimmer and reach the goals that they want and expose them to like those big meets that I was able and Simone was able to be exposed to, you know what I'm saying? So the goal, it sounds like, is to reduce the structure and financial limitations to getting people mm -hmm. of color into swimming. That and just to support, just to support them because it's a very different experience for like, uh, my experience is going to be different than a white person's experience right. in, on the same team. Right. Um, and I was fortunate enough to, like I said earlier, I lived in a bubble and all I wanted to do was win as a kid. So like that just didn't even cross my mind. I was like, I just want to beat whoever. I just want to see a number one by my name. But honestly, it wasn't even, I hate to say this, but it wasn't even until I got into my 20s. Did I even stop and really think about, wow, so there's like no Black people in the sport of swimming. Like, so there's you were kind of blind us. at first. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, which is it's not good. But um, I was so young and just naive back then. So. 
Yeah. Well, we're just so proud to be, you know, able to talk with you with this exciting new uh, addition to your resume of being an Olympian. Yeah, and I know. Hopefully it's we'll have you back. Coming as- back around. A yeah. champion. Um, yeah, that, I'd love to have you back after, vision. You, after you win. Yeah, that would be crazy. <laughs> yeah. Golly. Just hold that vision, confidence. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, like yeah. So, um, we we want to, again, we want to be respectful of your time. We have a fun little sprinter round if you're willing to do that. But before yeah, we course. go there, um, is there anything that we have not asked you that you would like to share with our listeners? Um, yeah, I think it's really important just to note that, um, I mean, the normal person has anxiety in this day and age. And I feel like throughout this comeback, like I've learned that, you know, like I said earlier, it was really scary to come back. It was really scary. Like, what would people think of me like two years later and she's trying to swim again or, you know, just what, you know, what your perceptions of what people think of you were, were very prevalent when I started swimming again. And I think what helped me was to find something that I love to do that had nothing to do with swimming. And I encourage anyone who's listening that, that I recommend that as well. I think having something that has nothing to do with your sport or something that causes you all of the emotions um, is, is a good diversion from that. And it's really healthy mentally to be able to shut things off. Like prior to trials, I was, um, I have a fiber business. So I was weaving and I also was listening to a lot of audiobooks. And, um, do I normally listen to audiobooks? Absolutely not. <laughs> but it's something that takes your mind off of, you know, like the Olympic trials is coming up and we're leaving for Olympic trials in a week. We're leaving in two days. Like it's just such a time just doesn't stop. And you need a way to, um, just, to calm down because you're not going to swim your best when you're tensed. So I just encourage everyone to find something like if it's writing, if it's painting, even if you're not good at it, just like, if you like it, just try and do something that has nothing to do with your sport. Um, it, re- it really helps. That's a great that is, tip. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, really, really quick. I know I said it was the last question, but uh, can you <laughs> explain real quick your fiber business and are you coming yeah. back to that? If people want to um, you know, see that, where could they find we, it? You'd be poor. You said you're sold out pretty much right now. Oh yes. Um, so luminary started in this time last year, actually, like during, um, du- well, not during COVID I had done it a little bit earlier to a- actually what I had just said, because I was so stressed about 2019 nationals was my first like big meet back. Um, it was my first taper meet, I guess. And I was so, so, so stressed out, y'all. I just was like, what if I just go and not like all the what ifs really? And so I was at Barnes and Nobles trying to relieve stress. I was like, I'm going to just go to Barnes and Nobles and sit down and read. Like a lot of people, I feel like do that. And I I was about to check out. Yeah, I was about to check out and I saw a uh, tapestry kit just like in the knickknack section. And I was like, I'll try it. Like I just picked it up was so bad at it but it but I had followed the instructions like three hours had gone by and I was like oh that's nice like I didn't think about any of my stressors so I went I I kind of did some research and I went to Michael's got some you know got a bigger kit and I mean I was obsessed I think it was just because I wasn't good at it and I really wanted to be good at it and um then kind of got away from me because I went to ISL in 2019 so it just kind of I wasn't really didn't have time for it So then during COVID, um, I, you know, was sitting there, I wasn't swimming for like a month and, and I just got, y'all, I got, when I say obsessed, I would wake up and work out and weave all day and then go to dinner and then weave until I went to bed. I just was like, there's so many possibilities of designs. And so finally people were like, Hey, like, are you selling those? And I was like, I mean, no, but I can. (laughs) So then I just started making them and selling them. And so now it's become like an actual business. And, um, I have like, like my, I have a sunroom in my apartment and it's like my office, I like to call it. And so, um, I will be coming back because I actually just love making stuff, even if nobody buys them, because I get to put it up in my apartment and it's my decoration. Um, and then if somebody buys it, that's amazing. But, um, 
I've definitely been able to just like meet so many people. I feel like it's kind of an alter ego for me. I have like my swim side and then I'm part of like a fiber community, which is like kind of crazy to say, but they were, I just didn't realize how deep into the fiber community I was until I made the Olympics and like everyone was so excited. And they're like, <laughs> we have a fellow fiber artist going to the Olympics. <laughs> that just sounds so crazy, but um, it probably doesn't happen yeah, too often. <laughs> no, it, it definitely doesn't. I just, I've met a lot of really, really cool people who just have a very different perspective. And that's also what I'm looking forward, mo- looking forward to the most um, on this trip other than like really getting a medal for Team USA is to broaden like my culture and I get to meet, I'll be able to meet so many cool people just with so many different stories. So um, yeah, definitely weaving has allowed me to meet cool people, reduce my stress. um, And it's like a nice side hustle as well. So I will be back probably in like two months or so, but um, yeah, I will one day. I'll be, hopefully, I can remember how to do it when I come back. <laughs> and we'll put your website in the show notes so people can mark, okay. like, mark their calendar for a couple of months for to a return. Check it out. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. Are you ready to do the sprint around quick answers? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Is this just like the first thing that comes to mind? First thing. Well, yes. First thing that comes to mind. Okay. Cat, cat or dog? Dog. Red or blue? Blue. Milk chocolate or dark chocolate? Milk chocolate. Kickboard or no kickboard? Kickboard. Mountains or beach? Mountains. Football or baseball? Football. iPhone or Android? (laughs) iPhone. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Sunrise or sunset? Sunrise for sure. Nail polish or no nail polish? for you i'm gonna go no nail polish okay maria's got some for you here okay favorite okay. Co- favorite color um mustard oh, i love it that's such a fiber <laughs> optic i mean fiber arts answer you probably mm-hmm. know all those fun colors i favorite live yeah. in a mu- i live in a mustard colored house <laughs> oh i love that i love that that's my um, dream one day that might be my but my favorite answer ever favorite <laughs> that is mustard. a really great answer <laughs> Thank you. Favorite favorite pizza topping? Bacon. Favorite vegetable? Favorite vegetable is, I'm going to go ahead and say Brussels sprouts right now, even though I'm not always a fan, but for now, Brussels sprouts. Okay. Favorite swim complex in the U.S.? Ooh, that's a good one. I love Stanford. I love their swim complex. Mm -hmm. Favorite music genre? Um, Old school R&B. 2000s r and Okay. Shoe size? 11. Any siblings? One sibling, older. Okay. Uh, this, this one, I never know. If, if What's your favorite Star Wars character? I unfortunately do not watch Star Wars. I what about Harry you. Potter? Harry Potter, my favorite character is probably Herm- Hermione. Okay. <laughs> uh, and can you cook? Yes. Mm-hmm. And not like a chef, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, what word comes to mind when you first dive into the water? What one word comes to mind? If you can think of that. Here we, uh, here we go. Is that one word? Yeah, that's good <laughs> enough. One that's phrase. Here we go. That's That'll beautiful. do it. Here we go. Yep, 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 yep. All right, Natalie, this has been such a pleasure Thank for us. Thank you so us. much. Yes, yeah, we're, we're so we're gonna wise. Have fun. Yeah. I got we're lots gonna be of cheering for you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate you, guys, appreciate you guys having me on the show. We appreciate you being on just right after trials. We know you're busy and getting ready to take off to Hawaii for yes. Olympic training camp. Can't yeah, wait. so Can't excited wait. about that. Haven't been there either. So I'm excited to like just add another place to my list of traveled places. That's great. Really good. Cool. Mm-hmm. All right. All well, right. Take care. We'll be take watching. Care. Thank you. Bye bye. It's now time for the takeaways. Maria, you and I have heard the takeaways are the best part of the show. That's right, Kelly, because the takeaways are curated information, which is what we give to our clients when we coach them. If you would like to take your performance to the next level in health, life, or leadership, go to our website and schedule your free 30-minute consultation. Yes, just click on our coaching page and book there. We're looking forward to bringing out the champion in you. And now, the takeaways. 
Oh, what a fantastic interview with brand new Olympian, Natalie Hines. Oh, yeah. just amazing. She, she had so much wisdom. So she did. I, I was tr- totally struck by the idea that when one is going into a high pressure situation like Olympic trials, which is even more, they say more pressure filled than the actual Olympics, because, yeah. you know, you can finish fifth or sixth at our trials and make almost any other Olympic team in the, in the country, I mean, in, in the, the world. world. Mm. So um, that kind of pressure really can take people out. So if, if anyone has things in their life that they're even worried about, just like you, you, she said, she was worried, oh, we're leaving in a week, we're leaving in two days, we're here. And so she did what she said was she addressed the what ifs with a plan A and a plan B. And, um, you know, I, I, I have mentioned this a lot before we've talked about it, but um, Keith Bell, who's a famous sports psychologist, especially for swimmers says, add a so to your what ifs. So what if I don't make the team? So Natalie actually took it a step step further. further. Mm. Plan A is I make the team all as well. Plan B is I don't make the team. And you know what? She says, I still had a great swimming career. So I absolutely loved that whatever we're facing in life, it's like, okay, here's my ideal plan. This is what I would like. But if that falls short or something, you know, doesn't go well, what is that plan B look? And I can live with that. So it kind of deflates the pressure a little bit. Yeah. And I, and I think even more, yes, absolutely. And, the, but the, I, you know, one thing that I hadn't heard is like, well, what if I miss a wall? Well, what if I hit the wall and have a great, you know, you know, yes. beautiful push offs? Like, because basically what you're doing is you're neutralizing the bad thoughts by, you know, when you imagine missing the wall and then you imagine having this amazing, you know, push off or, you know, whatever I, you know, I think that's, I hadn't really thought about that, but I think what she has learned and what's made the difference for her is, is really her mental, mental, you know, her mind talk, her, you know, how, how to control and how to manage her thoughts, which she does with other things. Um, but yeah, I love that. That's a great takeaway. Um, my first takeaway is kind of related to that. It's like talking to someone it's really, she said, you know, some people can write and some people can, you know, manage it themselves, but I really need to talk things through. And that is ah, so true. It's been, it's been true for my life. And it's been true to the people that I've listened to. It's like, they, if they, if people can articulate what they're afraid of, what the bad stuff is, the anxiety they get it out there and it like loses all of its power. Even if you're not, even if the person they're talking to is not listening, you know, they're, they're, you know, I mean, if they're not reacting to it. Um, and I, you know, I always quote Mr. Rogers. He says, if you can talk about it, you can deal with it. So I really like the fact that she mentioned that she talks to people about, you know, the stuff to help also neutralize some of the, you know, maybe anxious anxiety. What was yes. Your... Yeah. My second takeaway was, um, that she really created boundaries, you know, for herself, um, going into the trials three weeks, you know, kind of cutting activities out that weren't really going to push her forward or be positive. And, um, just, just that, I think having boundaries on even, she said, you know, to some degree, you know, not looking at other people at the meet, you know, she would look, you look away from people if she didn't want to, you know, what are they doing? She turned off her social media. She didn't want to see what other people were doing and just being a little selfish, focusing on herself. But when you're really trying to accomplish something incredible, you do have to really focus on yourself. So I love the boundaries. I, I like that too. And, and that can be hard. I think, especially as women, we're taught that we always have to take care of everybody and yeah, um, so, and obviously that was a new thought for her, but it was, you know, working for, and it's just temporary, you know, it's not yeah, forever. Right. You can't do it forever. <laughs> yeah. Right. So the, the second takeaway for me that I just loved was have something else, her, her interest in fiber arts and the way that's blossomed into a business. So great. And I can remember times in my life where I've done things that I wasn't good at. Like I remember taking up toll painting, which is like paint primitive painting on wood. It's like, I was terrible at it, but like her, I loved it. It took me completely away from whatever hard thing was the regular part of my life. So I think, you know, have something else, you know, don't be just about whatever, you know, the the main thing is have some other, you know, thing that you do that takes you away. And also it gave her another completely new community 
not the swimmers, the fiber artists. They're all like, oh, we got, we got a girl in the Olympics. The fiber, fiber artist Olympian. I love it. <laughs> the fiber artists are being represented. I love it. Yes, that. yes. So, oh, anyway, great, great interview. Oh yeah, it was so great. I hope people listen to the whole thing, even though these are just the takeaways, but um, Maria, another you know, great adventure with you and uh, see you on the next right. one. Love you so much. Love you, Kelly. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the Champions Mojo podcast with host Kelly Palace and Maria Parker. Champions Mojo is produced by Cobra Media, and a new episode debuts every Tuesday. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts and leave us a five-star review. Follow Champions Mojo on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Champions Mojo.